Chance, Oki, Bonzu, hello everyone. My name is Chantal Chagnon. I am Cree, Anishinaabe, and Metis from Muscat Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, which is in Treaty 6 territory. Uh, I know a lot of you are calling in from Treaty 6 territory, and so I wanted to start by acknowledging my home territory the Cree, the Soto, the Blackfoot, Metis of Region 4. Uh, the Dene, as well as the Nakota Sioux, and all First Nations people and non-Indigenous people that call Treaty 6 home. I am calling in from Treaty 7 territory, Mohinstis. This is the home of the Blackfoot of Siksika, Gainai, and Bagani. The Sarsi Dene from Tsutsina, and the Stony Nakota from Morley, which includes Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. We're also walking in the footsteps of Métis Region 3, which is why I proudly wear my Métis sash to act as that bridge between Indigenous and non-Indigenous culture. When we acknowledge the land, we're actually acknowledging far more than that. We're acknowledging the history that is steeped into this land. When we trace it back, it's really incredible how far it goes. We have ceremonial grounds that we have tested artifacts that have been uncovered, and they're over 15,000 years old. These are ceremonies and teachings and languages and stories that have been shared generation after generation after generation. Anytime we do find a sacred site and archaeologists do the research, they are finding more of them than not predate 15,000 years, which is incredible, and that's staggering. And that's part of the reason we do the land acknowledgement. But it's also to acknowledge the relationship that we have to the land. We have all come from many different places, but we have all come to this land for a reason, for a purpose. So it's really about recognizing the relationship that we have not only have to the land itself, but to each other. That relationship is invaluable to be able to learn about ourselves as well as our future generations and setting that example for them. It's the responsibility that we have to learn about that past so that we make the world a better place for all of our future generations. And so to welcome everyone into this circle tonight, I wanted to share with you the Cree welcome song. Traditionally, when we sing, so story, or sing songs and stories, um, we do it rounds of four to honor the four directions of the medicine wheel. But this song is a little bit different. We sink it in rounds of three, and that's to keep the circle open and welcoming so everyone completes the circle today. Because in a circle, we're all connected. There's no beginning, there's no end. No one is greater or less than anyone else in the circle, just like in the hoop of life. So it teaches us to honor each other for those differences. Because if we were all exactly the same, the world would be incredibly boring and nothing would ever get done. So we need those differences to bring balance and to bring understanding to each other. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna agree 100% of the time, but it's when we can come together and find those compromises, that's truly what makes our community resilient. When we sing this song, um, oftentimes we, we all say all my relations in Cree, and that means we're all related. That's not only people, we the two-leggeds, but it's the animals. They have a voice, they have a stake in our world and our relationships. They have so much to teach us if we just take the time to get to know them. It honors the standing people, which are the plants, the crawlers, which are the bugs, the swimmers, which are the fish, and the flyers, which are the birds, and all of the winds that connect us, all of the earth that connects us and sustains us. This song honors all of those aspects in the circle that bring the circle to fruition. The reason we sing it in rounds of three to keep it open is so that if you have to leave or as people come in, they're always welcome in the circle. The circle is like the heart. It is always expanding and contracting. We pump that heart, um, that blood, but also it's what connects each and every one of us. It shows us that unconditional love is truly what drives that circle. It's that ability to love oneself, but love everything around us as well. And so Mia Sin, which is the Cree welcome song, uh, is from the Natoha family from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation. Um, and they are on the border of um, Alberta and Saskatchewan. But I thank the family for keeping this song and this story alive because for so many generations, it was illegal for us to speak our languages, for us to share our stories, for us to share our songs, for us to even wear our regalia. So what I'm wearing, um, this is my regalia. It's not a costume because costumes for Halloween. I was a superhero for Halloween, but it's uh, an extension of who I am. It's the essence of who I am. It's my very being. My skirt, my ribbon skirt, it connects me to the earth. 
It represents the teepee and all the sacredness that is within. And it also represents my family, my story, my teachings. And so when we see regalia, it's an honor to be able to wear it again in public. When we hear these songs and stories, it shows how resilient a people can be and how resilient our earth can be because she will recover and she will come back. And so Miyasin, the Cree welcome song, it not only means welcome, it also means beautiful. I'm gonna stand up to sing it. Miyasin, Miyasin, Hasemina, Hasemina, Epepakuti. Thank you so much, Chantal. What a great note to start on. And hi, everyone. Welcome to Defending Alberta's Parks Together. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. It's really great to see so many people on the Zoom call. Um, or I guess I, I can't really see most of you, but so nice that there's so many people here. My name is Emily Rendell Watson. I'm an Edmonton journalist, I'm currently the managing editor of Taproot Edmonton which is the flagship publication of Taproot Publishing, um, which we're building a new way to do and fund local journalism here in Edmonton. Um, and I also spend a lot of time in Alberta parks myself as a recreational user. So I'm super excited to be here tonight um, as your moderator. And uh, as the moderator, I'll be introducing your panelists um, who are gonna be presenting and let you know what's coming up kind of as the evening goes on. We have a lot of great presentations scheduled uh, from representatives of CPAWS Northern and Southern Alberta. Uh, we have Arteryx Ambassador Will Gad and Nikita Rubalak of Art for Alberta Parks who are gonna be talking tonight. Um, but before we get started with the first presentation, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. So right now there are Zoom instructions on the screen. Uh, I know a lot of you probably have been doing Zoom a lot over the last couple months, um, but if you haven't and you have any questions at all, you can uh, shoot us a quick note in the chat and happy to help you out. Um, the event is being recorded. So anyone who can't make it this evening can watch it back on YouTube, but just so you're aware, um, we are recording right now. Uh, and we will be taking questions throughout the event also via the chat function that um, if you're not sure how to access that, there should be a little bar on the bottom of your screen. Um, 
that are actually it's in the zoom instructions so, <laughs> so you can access the chat that way and you can send us uh, questions that we're going to be doing um, about a 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end so we'll be covering those then um, and there is a chance that that Q&A will run a bit past 8 p.m so we welcome all of you who are able to stay to please stick around uh, for that hopefully we won't go too far past then but um, it would be great if you're able to stick around and regardless if we can't get to all of the questions if you send send some by the chat we already have some that are coming through uh, Instagram or email um, if we aren't able to get to all the questions this evening then uh, CPAWS will be doing a follow-up um, blog post to address those so um, stay tuned for that and uh, otherwise I think that's all for housekeeping stuff so our first presentation tonight is Chris Smith and Becky Best Burtwistle. Um, Chris is with CPAWS Northern Alberta and Becky is with CPAWS Southern Alberta and they're going to be giving us an overview and some updates on what's currently happening with the parks issue. So over to them. All right, uh, thanks for that Emily. Um, I'll be kicking things off here today. Um, welcome everybody to uh, our information session and action night on defending Alberta parks together. And without further ado, uh, we'll jump right into things here. So um, for anybody who um, isn't up to speed on all the details of, of why we're here, um, I'm just gonna go through some uh, brief history of how we got to where we are uh, and kind of elaborate on um, what's happened since and where we're going. So the government of Alberta announced it's optimizing Alberta Parks plan on February 29th, 2020. Uh, this plan laid out a number of initiatives, uh, including 164 parks for proposed removal from the system, um, closing or partially closing 20 sites this year and increasing camping service fees, shortening the operating seasons for some of the campgrounds and the closure of two of the visitor centers, as well as uh, park, uh, implementing park partnerships through prospective sale or transfer to First Nations or entities such as municipalities or nonprofits. This is what was in the Government of Alberta's um, initial media release on their Optimizing Alberta Parks plan. Since then, uh, there has been a general lack of updates and information um, that have been provided by the government. Uh, They've indicated in the release that additional information would become available on the park partnerships on May 1st, but due to COVID-19, the government announced this would be delayed until a future date. It has now been more than six months since we last received an update on these park partnerships. The government's latest update released on November 4th uh, stated that uh, Environment Parks wants to continue uh, to work with interested groups to secure new partnerships and extend others. However, there is still no information on what these partnerships will look like, how they will operate, what activities will be or not will be allowed, how many sites have interested partners already, and how interested partners could apply for these partnerships. This leads us to where we are today. Since the announcement, there has been a substantial public interest in this issue, heightened by the challenges presented by COVID-19 and the unprecedented usage of our parks and public lands this summer. As Albertans flocked to our parks and wild spaces, it raised questions about why the government was looking at removing and closing parks when it was clear that there was a substantial demand for outdoor recreation. Rural municipalities, outdoor recreation retailers, conservation organizations, and concerned Albertans all had questions about what this would mean for our park system. This led to calls for public consultations to be done to better inform the public on these changes but also so that the public in turn could provide their own thoughts and concerns to the government on this optimizing Alberta parks plan. Unfortunately, the government has given no indication um, that they will conduct such consultations on this. And thus, in order to give Albertans a voice on this matter, Defend Alberta Parks was born. So in order to put these changes into context, we've looked at several different aspects of what would be impacted by this decision. One consideration was the geographic distribution of these park areas that are being impacted. While there is a huge clustering of sites along the eastern slopes of our Rocky Mountains, as you can see on the map on the right, the proposed sites to be delisted stretch across the province from the grasslands to the boreal. 
We also looked at what these changes mean within the historic context of parks establishment within our province. It can sometimes take decades for a proposed site to become uh, a legislated park. And so we wanted to see how much these park delistings would impact the overall Alberta park system. As you can see with this graph, uh, if the government moves forward with delisting the sites um, they initially announced, uh, it would turn back the clock about four decades um, in terms of progress done on parks establishment in our province. As we moved into summer and continued to see the high usage of our parks, we wanted to know what these changes would mean for the number of campsites within the Alberta park system. We set out uh, to look at the number of campsites in each proposed site to be delisted and determine that approximately one third of all campsites could be impacted by this plan. Note, however, that this doesn't necessarily mean that all these campsites will necessarily be lost if this plan goes forward, just that these sites will be uh, delisted and no longer be a part of the Alberta Parks system and the associated standards that come with that. In order to try and figure out how the government chose these particular parks to be delisted and closed, we filed a freedom of information request uh, back in May of 2000, or uh, uh, this summer. We requested that um, for all essential uh, senior minister, deputy minister, uh, correspondence to and from the parks division, um, basically on all the materials that were used in creating the Optimizing All Better Parks plan. We received the results in July, which included 85 pages of internal documents related to the decision. For anybody who's interested, um, that the, all 85 pages are available on our website. Um, we haven't omitted anything that we obtained from that freedom of information request and you're free to uh, look through it as you would like. Uh, and you can find that just through um, our Defend Alberta Parks uh, page on our website. So while there was a substantial amount of information in the documentation we received, uh, there were four issues of particular interest that were highlighted. These were Sorry if that's all showing up. Um, uh, the government's plan to delist Alberta parks included op the options of removing the protected area status of these parks, uh, selling the land within the uh, agricultural white zone of the province, or uh, delisting or reverting them to vacant public land. Um, for the second, the, the, was that the government was advised that this plan doesn't align with the overall intents of the park system. Um, Additional information was that there was insufficient data determined to understand the impacts these decisions would have on the budget and that past experience of divesting sites has shown that it tends to come with a cost. And fourth is that the government ignored advice to conduct broad public consultations and engagement on this plan, which we feel would have helped alleviate a lot of the concerns um, that have cropped up with it. So what about partnerships? The government's plan made it clear that they wanted to delist these uh, sites, but that they also were looking for th third party partners who could potentially take over the management of these parks as part of a cost saving measure. This isn't uncommon for Alberta Parks, which currently maintains 121 facility operator agreements with third party operators who help operate and maintain campgrounds and day use facilities. However, the difference between these existing facility operator agreements and the proposed partnerships, um, oh shoot, I've lost my spot here. Um, right, uh, so basically the 121 facility operator agreements that currently exist, all exist within parks that are still part of the Alberta park system. They have not been delisted. Um, Flowing from this, there's been no rationale provided by the government as to why these parks in particular need to be delisted and have their protections removed in order to seek these partnerships, as there is ample evidence that these agreements can work without delisting the site. Why does this all matter? Uh, the table I'm showing you here basically shows the different management intents for the land use designations that are involved in this plan being provincial parks, provincial recreation areas, natural areas, and if they're delisted, uh, returning to public lands. Um, however, the overall sentiment and what is trying to be conveyed with this is this. Protected areas are a specific type of public land that has been established to maintain certain environmental or recreational features. 
a wide range of activities that are generally permitted on public lands are typically not allowed in uh, protected areas. These activities can include industrial developments such as mining, quarrying, and oil and gas, but can also extend to recreational activities where they can negatively impact the values for which those sites were established. Essentially, protected areas are designed to protect the features they were designated for. Public lands are not. And Becky? Yeah, hi. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm going to take over now. Um, so my name is Becky. I'm from the CPOS Southern Alberta office. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris, for that. And as you can see on this chart that Chris was showing, there are a number of, number of formal designations for protected areas, um, but they fall under two acts. There's the Provincial Parks Act, and then there's, it's a doozy, get ready, the Wilderness Areas, Ecological Reserves, Natural Areas, and Heritage Rangelands Act, which has the super snappy acronym of WAHERNA. So there'll be a quiz later if anybody can recite that whole acronym. Um, <laughs> yeah, but removing the protections from either of these acts is really serious and it's basically irreversible. Uh, next slide, please. So I think it's safe to assume that many of you, like so many other Albertans, have been really alarmed by this plan to delist protected areas and have written their MLAs or the environment minister stating your opposition to it. And if you've been lucky enough to get a message back from your MLA or have read any statements from the minister, you might have heard something to the effect of land will remain under the protection of Alberta environment and parks or land will remain protected as public land. This is pretty confusing and purposefully misleading statement. It's intended to obscure the issue and confuse everybody. Uh, once protected areas are delisted and removed from the provincial park system, they will no longer have protections, as Chris stated. Uh, this week on Monday, we saw that the UCP caucus even felt the need to launch a new website and campaign to address what they call misinformation regarding parks. And this is an example of some of the materials they've been putting out. And I'd just like to take a moment and acknowledge that any information that we have published or quoted or that Chris has already gone through tonight has been pulled directly from government documents, statements, publications, and comments that government has made on this issue. So if there's any misinformation going on here, it's uh, coming from inside the house. So to delve a little deeper um, and understand why these statements are misleading, we kind of have to explore what the real difference between protected areas and public lands are. So yeah, you can see on this map here, um, the green is protected areas and the gray is not protected. So approximately 61% of Alberta is provincially managed public land, and the rest can fall into a few different categories, federally managed land, privately owned, uh, reserve or uh, military bases as well. Public lands are held in trust for all Albertans by the government. We depend on our government to ensure that these lands are managed responsibly and in the best interests of all Albertans. Next slide, please. To help illustrate this fact a little more clearly, uh, I pulled the organizational chart for Alberta Environment and Parks from their annual report. So as you can see clearly on this chart, everything under Minister Nixon's control is under the jurisdiction of Alberta Environment and Parks. This is just the name of the ministry that manages all environmental regulation in the province. Alberta Parks is a specific division that manages protected areas and Alberta Parks is down on the bottom left-hand corner of that image. Delisting parks will remove them from that division and oversight from that office. But technically, they're still going to be under the control of the land, would still be under control of the broader ministry, Alberta Environment and Parks, because of course, all public land in Alberta falls under that department. It's quite clear that these areas will no longer have the same protections once they're removed from the parks division. Next slide, please. So to reiterate, protected areas are a specific type of public land that has been established to conserve environmental values and recreation opportunities. Um, and yeah, some of these parks that we're talking about are small provincial recreation areas that are day use spots, that like have some picnic tables, that can be staging areas. But even these areas are important to keep open, public and accessible so new people can experience Alberta's natural places. Next slide, please. What can happen on public land? Public lands are meant to be managed and administered by the provincial government for a whole bunch of different activities. And like Chris said, these activities frequently include industrial developments. 
some examples of what these activities look like on the gr ground um, are like here right in front of you. This is commercial forestry. This is an example of something that happens on public land while that land is still under the jurisdiction of Alberta Environment and Parks. Next slide, please. Here's an example of mineral exploration roads. These are constructed and used on public land that is under the jurisdiction of Alberta Environment and Parks. Next slide, please. And here's an example of a coal mine something that can be operated on land that's public land under the jurisdiction of Alberta Environment and Parks. So it's clear there's a huge difference between parks and public land, and both are important to the lives of Albertans. And I just want to note that, of course, not all public land are industrial sites, and there are many places on public land that are so beautiful, and I, I love to recreate in them. However, removing parks from the system will be almost impossible to reverse, and after the year we've had, Albertans want more parks and protected areas, places that conserve the environment ensure, and ensure that we can have safe access to outdoor recreation. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a lot of questions. Um, like Chris said, the intent and details of the partnerships that the government is proposing is very unclear. Um, it also leaves us with no guarantees that the land will be removed from, uh, the park system will be protected. And until we receive clarity, that these parks will not be delisted and revert to public land, we will remain concerned about the real issue of parks losing protection. And we'll continue to ask Albertans to stand up and help us defend Alberta parks. Next slide, please. So, and Albertans have really stood up and voiced their opposition to these changes. So through, I'm sure many of you are aware, through the Defend Alberta Parks uh, campaign, which is a partnership with the Alberta Environment Network, over 15,000 lawn signs have gone out across the province, with the majority of them here in Calgary, where I'm calling in from tonight. Um, over 18,000 letters have been sent to the minister in opposition to this plan, and that's just through the CPAWS automatic letter writing tool that we have. Um, so I would assume there are thousands more that have been sent in. There have been grassroots protests in different parks, thousands of tweets and social media posts, and even more conversations about it. So my advice is we really have to keep it up. Um, the reaction this week from the UCP caucus showed that uh, they're really feeling a lot of pressure from Albertans and we need to continue to press our elected officials on this matter. Albertans want parks to stay public and they want them to stay protected and the government needs to listen to them. And yeah, that's it from me and Chris. And I just wanted to say thanks to Arcteryx Arc for co-hosting with us tonight and thanks to Chantel for her great land acknowledgement at the beginning. It was really lovely to start the evening with that. And I will pass it along. All right, thank you so much, Becky and Chris. Uh, that was a really um, great presentation and I definitely can probably not say that <laughs> acronym. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I'm not even gonna try, but uh, if there is a quiz, I will fail it. Um, all right, so just a reminder that uh, we are taking questions throughout the event via the chat function on Zoom. So if you do have questions that you're hoping that one of our panelists um, can answer, you can throw those in the chat. And uh, if you have one that's directed to one of our panelists in particular, feel free to uh, note that in there as well. Um, otherwise, we're gonna move on to our next presentation, which is from Will Gadd. Um, he is a uh, Arcteryx ambassador, and he's gonna be talking about the outdoor recreation perspective on the parks issue. So over to you, Will. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully this will share. And now there is a, I think we have to cancel the spotlight video to share this. Um, Interesting. You've I, there's a screen I've never seen before on Zoom when I hit uh, when I hit share screen. I've done this before. It's got a totally different screen that does not actually have an option to share the desktop in any way. Um, anybody have any ideas on that? It's a totally new screen. Let's just try it. Let's see what happens here. Nope. You guys have got me locked out in some way here. I think unfortunately. Okay, well, uh, we can always, we could maybe wait uh, and help you with your technical difficulties. I wonder if maybe we want to try to go to Nikita first, if you're, if you are ready, we can 
do a little <laughs> switcheroo oh, yeah. unless you think you think you think you have it no i've never seen this screen before and i've done probably a hundred of these okay I, I wonder it's not offering me an option to actually it's it's trying to share a video or something um, oh okay well don't you just love technology because i don't yeah <laughs> um, did you, did you well, maybe if you take me off spotlight video if i've taken off that i wonder if i'm uh okay in well maybe i'll let i'll let um uh maybe Sarah or Taylor, if you are able to help, will Nikita, would you be ready to uh, present now instead? Sure, I can go ahead. Okay, so um, thank you very much. So Nikita Rubilak, um is with Art for Alberta Parks and uh, she's gonna be talking about grassroots community engagement uh, and that perspective in terms of the parks issue. And thank you for jumping in. <laughs> oh, no problem. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Awesome. I think should that does that look good for everybody? I'm assuming yes. Okay. Well, hi everybody. Thank you so much for attending this panel discussion. And it's so awesome to I guess see I can just see the participant number, but it's awesome to see so many people connected to this issue and eager to learn more. Thank you also to the organizers and of course the panelists. Um, and Chantel so much for delivering that beautiful welcoming song. Um, Truly the work you all do is very inspiring and it does motivate me, so that's awesome. But here, I'll introduce myself a little bit more for context. Oh. So my name is Nikita Rubilak. As Emma mentioned, I'm an aspiring artist and lifelong nature lo lover who grew up here in the Edmonton area on Treaty 6 territory. Um, one of my favorite things to do is combine my love of nature and art. In my spare time, I spend a lot of time in the outdoors, frequenting Alberta parks to rock climb, mountain bike, hike, learn more about their cultural history, and of course hug trees. Sometimes I'll even bring a paintbrush or a sketchbook there with me. If you ever see me, I might be doodling along the way. Um, I graduated from U of A with a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental and Conservation Sciences. And recently I started a position in science communication where I can combine both my love of the environmental sciences and art. Uh, the reason I guess why I've been included on this panel is I was the lead organizer for Art for Alberta Parks, uh, which as Emily mentioned is a grassroots project that brought together local artists um, with the goal of creating artwork inspired by each of the park that was at risk of being delisted. Uh, so just a heads up, the following slides are mostly to showcase some of the amazing art that was submitted. So why did I decide to care about the parks issue and how did I get involved with Defend Alberta Parks? So this one really hit home for me. Um, late February, when the provincial government announced their plan to quote unquote optimize Alberta Parks, I felt a ping in my heart. I was frustrated and I was confused. And, um, excuse me, um, and I felt a little bit of grief for these places. So, because these parts have helped foster my love and appreciation for the outdoors, as I'm sure for many of you. And I would even go fa so far as to say that they helped motivate me to pursue a degree and now employment, I guess, in the environmental field. Um, also, especially during these times, I don't want to bring up COVID, but I think many people are craving accessible outdoor spaces. Um, and beyond the human uses, as Becky and Chris mentioned, there are numerous other reasons why these parks are very, imp very important to protect or retain their protected area status. Um, okay, so next slide here. Um, more about the actual Alberta Parks, Art for Alberta Parks project. I would love to tell you that this was a very carefully calculated and planned out project but it was kind of messy. It was an impulsive idea that I decided to run with. And I actually believe that one afternoon late May, I had an extra cup of coffee and a lot of build up, built up frustration and creative energy. And I began to think um, maybe I could create a painting for each of the affected parks, you know, raise awareness, mostly just share with friends and my family on social media, and maybe raise a few bucks for sea paws if people liked the pieces enough to buy. So, I guess the full story is I took to Instagram, which is a very, I don't know, it was very impulsive. Um, 
And originally my plan was to commit to creating a painting for each affected park. So halfway through a series of videos I uploaded to Instagram, I realized that roughly 175 parks were affected in some way. And this meant a target of 175 paintings. You know, that was a lot and I didn't really think that through too well. Um, but in short, that's how Art for Alberta Parks grew. Uh, word got out that I was working on this endeavor and people started reaching out to help. Um, the support was overwhelming. So I'm just gonna switch screens here and take a look at all of these lovely faces. So here's a snapshot of the amazing team that grew over time. I'm missing a few photos of people, but I think you can get a sense of the group that came together. Uh, some of these people, I in fact had never met, um, where to just traveled and they started reaching out because they were passionate about art and about the cause. Um, but others I've known for my entire life. So it was like truly a variety. Um, each person came from a different background and contributed a different artistic style and medium and had a different relationship to the issue. But I guess like even at a distance, uh, we were all connected and working towards a collective goal. Um, and that I think was one of the key ingredients to success and why this grassroots project like came together in such a I don't know, lovely way. So in the end, we were a group of about 30 different artists who contributed nearly 80 works of art to raise awareness for the Defend Alberta Parks campaign. Um, so I, the result was it wasn't a flop and I was so pleasantly surprised. I will admit that there was a lot of self-doubt and questioning myself in the beginning. I had never run my own art sale before and never mind coordinated a full group of artists. But thankfully, I had an amazing support team. So major shout out to C Paws Northern Alberta here. They reached out to me early on in the process, like very early on uh, to offer support. So whether it was making a website, my first slide there was a capture of our Art for Alberta Parks website that was designed and created by Saren Mason of C Paws Northern Alberta, so beautiful. And uh, there was also like support through helping me through spreadsheets, coordinating art delivery and just overall encouragement. So it was definitely a team effort. And basically I went in with a vision and a goal, didn't have any preconceived expectations um, as this was all new territory for me. So early on, I accepted that this was going to be an ever evolving process. And I sought out a lot of feedback. Um, people I didn't know were reaching out to either donate or purchase artwork from all over the province and even across Canada, which was amazing. And I think this truly showed how much this issue connects us. Um, and I had people who believed in the cause and believed in me. It was, in the end, it seemed like a little bit of a perfect storm. So we collected an incredible inventory of artwork, as you can see scattered through this PowerPoint. Um, but was art created for every single park? No, um, but that's not the point. We raised over $6,000 and nearly sold out within the first day. It was, I get, my mind was blown. Um, so sure, $6,000 is not going to buy out the government and immediately reverse the decision, but it did connect an incredible, incredible group of people, artists, fellow advocates, those who weren't even aware of the issue to begin with, and hopefully it created a platform for where people felt like they were making a difference. So it wasn't a flop, thank goodness. Um, and so broader implications here, I just wanted to touch on, hopefully not getting too cheesy or cliche, but for a while it was hard for me to accept that the project was successful since I'm sure, I, I think maybe you can all relate. It can feel a little hopeless and helpless sticking up for an issue that you don't immediately have control of. Um, but looking back at all the folks we connected to the issue, that's gotta be some level of success, I think. And I can, hopefully can speak on behalf of everyone who contributed in saying that we felt empowered to use this project and our passion for art to speak up for a cause that we believe in. So Art for Alberta Parks did create this platform. So whether you're a contributing artist, a purchaser of the artwork, a website browser, a post share, anybody who's engaged was engaged. And that is so, so powerful. 
and I think an essence of grassroots movements and projects. So word is spreading and there is collective action and I think it can really make a difference. So I see the potential in this type of work and I encourage you all creative folk or not so artistically inclined folk to trust your gut to see if you see an opportunity to make a difference. Um, in addition to protecting our parks, I do wanna to touch on the fact that we can use this campaign and platform to recognize the traditional lands on which these parks exist and to acknowledge the history behind their creation and think about what the protection of these parks can and maybe should like look like in the context of reconciliation. Um, with that, thank you so much for every, to everybody who helped or, and also for listening, especially the artists who donated a lot of their time and talent to the cause. Although the sale is officially finished, that was done in September, um, the website is still live, um, so I encourage you to take a look through the amazing works of art and the artists' bios on there. I find it really inspiring, and I like to scroll through every so often. It's a good reminder of why we're doing what we're doing, so thanks, everybody. That's the end of my presentation. <laughs> I welcome any questions, of course. Thank you so much, Nikita. That was really great, and uh, what a great idea to go and scroll through and see all the great art that has been created and support. Um, so that's wonderful. Uh, before we check back in with Will again, um, just a quick reminder that we are recording, uh, for those that have joined since the beginning, we are recording the event. Um, so anyone who can't make it can watch on YouTube or if you want to rewatch and uh, check back on, on something. Um, and then just a reminder as well, we are still taking questions. Um, so like Nikita said, if you have any questions for her or any of our other panelists, um, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, but let's try and see if, Will, we can get you back up uh, and going again. So like I said before, Will, uh, for those that are joined since then, Will Gad is an Arcteryx ambassador and he's gonna be sharing the outdoor recreation perspective on the parks issue. And it looks like we are a go, so I will hand it over to you. Unmute myself and we'll have sound and we have picture that all looks good. Yeah, good to go, thumbs looks, up, looks thank great. you very much. <laughs> cool, so I'll just jab through this. Um, most of what I do and I'm kind of well known for is outside of Alberta, climbing Niagara Falls and um, doing all these wild adventures out there of one kind or another. Um, so you know, ice on top of Kilimanjaro, things like that. But I grew up in Alberta and I've spent, you know, a majority of my free time beating around in Alberta parks of one kind or another or Alberta public lands. That's one of the first trips I ever remember. It was somewhere behind about you know, Bisca. I'm like eight years old and you know, height of the Arcteryx clothing, right? That stuff is dialed there. You got jean jackets and a dog. We're going for it. But these are some of my earliest and best memories. I grew up in Calgary when I was young. We would just head out to the mountains every weekend and go for it. And you know, my, my parents called this child, you know, called this adventure, and I'm, it was sort of often more felt like child abuse at the time, but it was awesome. We like met bears and had all these adventures, and, and that's just what we did, mainly in K country, but all over the front range of the Rockies. And um, I got stuffed down into holes as a kid. This is somewhere, and you know, that was my dad's favorite activity. He'd be like, son, time to go learn how to go caving or whatever. <laughs> and my dad is bed gad. He's a noted naturalist and, and writer. And just by sheer osmosis, I now have a degree in geology and botany and everything else from hanging out with him. Um, and I, but I was always mainly interested in the adventure in the parks. You know, that's, that's what I thought of as, as parks, um, kind of their job was. And I went climbing with my dad. That's him on Mount Yamiska when I was pretty young, going for it up there. And I got into climbing and all these other sports, mainly because of my parents. But always in Alberta parks, there's 30 years later, be climbing somewhere, something in the general redshirt area on Mount Yamiska. But these are the best and most intense and, and beautiful memories of my life in many ways. I go all over the world, but then I come back to the Alberta parks and they are just awesome. And as I travel the world, I see how other countries manage their parks and their wild spaces. And I am always so glad to come back home where we do have space to roam and explore and, and be ourselves in ways you just can't be in, in other forms of parks in the world. I also do a lot of flying, so I get to fly over the parks. There's Mount Yamiska and looking um, north up toward the Ghost Wilderness area, Wipers, that whole zone. I'm at about 
Well, I'm about 4,000 feet over the legal limit. I had a WestJet flight go by me, actually. So don't get that high if you do this. this. But just getting to see these mountains from crawling down into them in caves, flying over them in paragliders, climbing rocks, and, and just seeing how they all go together. And you can tell what type of park you're flying over by what type of development is there in the front range, whether you're in a national park in Alberta, a provincial um, park that is designated for not development, and then you just start seeing the various levels of development. And I'm not anti-development, but I, I, I see so much of these parks and I use so much of them. You know, if I'm a kayaker, I'm out there. This is on Cataract Creek, Cataract Provincial Recreation Area, um, just south of Calgary a ways. And, and you really do start to see how important these little zones of protected areas are. And it's, it's just critical. We, we think of them as recreation. I think this is up Tent Ridge or somewhere skiing, but um, I, I'm out there, I don't know, 50, 80 days a year in these, in these parks, recreating or guiding or doing something incredibly important to me. And, and they're just, I, I wouldn't be who I am today without having spent so much time in these places. And I also do want to talk about other user groups because I am one of them. I get all dressed up in my camo and go wander around in the woods. And we tend to look at people out there in the parks who are using them in different ways than us as kind of the other. And I think one thing I've learned in doing some different forms of policy negotiation for public lands in various places of the world is that we are all in this together. And people might look different. You know, when I see somebody like this, I'm like, oh no, this is like one of those camel redneck dudes. But this is somebody that is enjoying these spaces in their own way. And uh, it's, it's important to find common ground with them and not just say, no, they're not me, therefore I don't want them in my parks. Because there's a lot of these people out there and, and I kind of pay attention on some of the non-standard outdoor recreational forums to what they're thinking. And it's, it's important that we engage and talk and discuss with people who are, who are not like us. Um, you know, and, and even if they're children, this is important. You know, <laughs> I get out there with my kids and, and this is a lot of Alberta. And I think those of us who are in the recreationalist camp are like, these people are, you know, they're hunters or they're developers or whatever. They're not us, therefore they're not on side. Well, they can be, you know, a lot of the original conservation in Alberta did come out of the hunting and outdoor community. And I think we need to do a better job of engaging with, with them and, and, recognizing that they're there as well. So just a little bit of a sidetrack there, but I think it's important to do that. And then there's the, the off-road crew as well. And I am, as a guide, I'm using off-road vehicles to get into the ghost and, and access those places. And I end up dealing with the off-road community. And a lot of them very much get this. They are not the kind of enemy of conservation. They are responsible, good people. And obviously, if you spend time on the Front Range in Alberta, there are places where this is mayhem. But these are also legitimate users. And I think it's important to pull, pull them into our fold rather than to push them out and, and to call them in versus say, no, you're not like us. So just a, a real, you know, lots of different ways for ha having inclusivity in the world and, and recognizing that. And also dealing with some of the issues with, uh, you know, I, I look at these as wild horses, but then I meet ranchers out there that are like, no, these are the feral horses. There's a lot of competing issues and ways to look at the land. And I tend to look at it as a recreationalist and think, what's the cool thing to do there? But we've got to get everybody involved. This is important to everybody in Alberta. And everybody in Alberta, by and large, supports their parks. But if we push them away and say, you're not like us, um, then it's not going to work out. And that's what we want to do is get out there with our families have cool adventures. Um, this is the Trans Alta Road. This is probably not strictly the way to go forward. Don't carry your kids on the roof of your vehicle. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, then there's infrastructure. And this summer, it was really clear to me that we need more infrastructure to deal with the people that are coming in. The trailheads are overwhelmed. One outhouse is not enough. Um, we're stopping trail setting at Nordic ski areas when they are just hammered. And as I meet these new users in the backcountry, um, you know, this is my daughter, she's getting hopefully a pretty good education in that, but I'm meeting a lot of new users in the backcountry and they don't have the training. And if they're in Kananaskis, they can't stop at the Barrier Lake Visitor Center anymore and even just get a little bit of an interaction that clues them in that um, our, our provincial parks in Alberta are not city parks. And I, I honestly think what I initially looked at as sort of really bad behavior, people, 
littering and so on, when I would engage them and say, hey, what's going on? They, they didn't get it. They're just like, well, where are the, you know, we're in a park. Where are the garbage cans? Where's the infrastructure? So we need more education and we need more involvement and conservation officers and points of interaction where we can educate these newer people to the mountains. You know, park, public safety did more rescues than they ever have in a 24 hour period. So at a time where we desperately need more support for our parks, it's, it's getting cut. And I'm, I'm really concerned about that. And plus, you know, again, it's fun for recreation and doing all these great things, you know. And then as a guide, this is one of my guests. I think we're on Amadeus on Barrier Mountain there and um, just on the front range again. This is partly how I make my living is taking people out there. And I take them out from all over the world and they just can't believe how awesome our parks are and what a great resource we have. And the idea of getting rid of some of these and turning them back into public land when I explain it to them, they're like, you're kidding, right? Like nobody can be that short-sighted. And, and the answer is unfortunately yes. So we have allies around the world that try and educate people and get them to engage. And just looking up into, I think that's the white goat or maybe the safleur back up there. Um, but just with one of my guests out there in the mountains having a great time. And then exploring new places, even though I've lived here for most of my life and I've, I've spent a lot of time, you know, on the forestry trunk road, visiting different parks that maybe are less popular. I'd never been to this one and, and it just blew my mind. This is Kakwa Falls Provincial Park and it's gorgeous. That waterfall is like 35 meters high and it is such a beautiful place. I did a Travel Alberta television commercial there because it is so cool and I got to rappel down and, and hang out. But there are, you know, I've been to what, maybe... 75 or 80 of Alberta's parks and they are just critical every single one of them and um, I, I hope that we can instead of delisting them and, and getting rid of them we can value them however we use them in a responsible way and call people in and engage so that you know uh, my, my kids can have their same pictures and, and maybe do this and 30 years or something and show the good times they have, what they learned about being out on the land and, and existing outside. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just a, a very passionate and, and um, I guess I call it a high use person in the parks from a lot of different perspectives. And I'm really, really grateful for all the work that CPAWS is doing, Defend Our Parks and the parks employees. They're under a huge strain. I'm sure some of them are on this call there's a lot going on there and um, the public safety, they've saved the lives of my friends. And I'm just very, very grateful to live in a province where we have these parks. And I, I hope that we all continue to value them and have great adventures and, and get out there with our family and friends and, and enjoy them. So I don't really have any of the policy stuff that Chris and Becky covered and thank you to Chantel for the welcome. And I love the art that is so cool. So I don't have anything else to add, but love our parks and, and protect them if you can. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Will. That was really great and uh, amazing photos. I love the, the old ones. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people enjoyed those. And um, yeah, like as Will was saying, if you're, please stick around because we are going to be talking about some of the actions that, um, you know, people can take on this issue. But before we get to that, um, I actually want to hand things back to Chantal because she would like to say a few uh, more words. So I will do that now. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much to everybody for sharing, you know, their expertise, their experience, their beautiful art, their amazing family photos. Um, I try and get my kids out on the land as much as possible. And it's funny because when you take them out on the land and you're trying to teach them things, they're like, Psh, whatever, but then they go with other people. And they're like, this is amazing. I'm like, I just shared that with you. But um, it's Nature is like our own schoolhouse, you know, it's where we can go to learn about how the world works. And this is why it's so important to engage people at a very, very young age. Um, we always talk about you know, our land or the land itself, nobody owns it. And so when we're talking about legislation to buy and sell it, it doesn't make any sense in, indigenous, in an indigenous concept or uh, worldview because we don't own the land. We're borrowing it from our future generations because they're the ones that are going to have to clean up the mess when we're gone. And so I think we need to start looking at things and planning things, you know, in that seven generations model. What's going to happen seven generations from now if we do give away, you know, a lot of these parks to development? Um, and is that really going to be worth it for, for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren? But also it's important to understand that, you know, 
this, this is <laughs> indigenous territory. We have a deep connection to the land. We have ceremonies on this land. We have our medicines on this land. We have connection to the animals. We talk about sustainability and a sustainable model. That is the indigenous model. We always give <laughs> before we take something back because if we take and take and take and take, there's gonna be nothing left. And when we think back to our own experiences growing up, growing up, we don't remember, you know, sitting in a shop or, you know, going in the tailings ponds. We remember, you know, swimming in a river or drinking from a river or, you know, swimming in a lake or sitting on a beach or camping with our family. We don't remember, you know, sitting in front of a television watching, well, I mean, video games. Some of us remember some video games, but it's more the moments that we shared with our family and with our friends. And Alberta has an amazing opportunity to really be a leader in tourism, and I'm not sure why we're gifting away that opportunity. Um, in, we now have a new organization that is actually just starting to bud and starting to move forward and grow, which is the uh, Indigenous Tourism of Alberta industry. And it's phenomenal, not to mention um, we've legalized it. So our tourism could boom if we really wanted to, because nothing's as fun as smoking something and going for a hike. I'm just saying, I don't know, because I don't smoke, but you know, I know a lot of people do, let's be honest. But having the opportunity as well to learn from Indigenous people who've been on this land, who have shared those, um, those medicines, the knowledge, the stories, the songs, the drumming, there was something really special about sitting with an elder or a knowledge keeper and learning those things while you're surrounded by all of those medicines, those standing people, those trees that have those stories, while you're seeing those animals. When kids walk through forests, they don't notice the backpack they're wearing unless it's really heavy, and in which case, as a mom, I always have to carry my kids' backpacks, but <laughs> They notice the birds, they notice the sounds, they notice the smells of the different medicines, you know, and those are the things that we have to cherish. Those are the things that we have to remember, you know, not progress or the economy, because without the environment and without the people that are supporting it, there is no economy. And the best way and most sustainable way to do that is, you know, through tourism. We can have some infrastructure, but we have to do it within moderation. We have to do it so we actually protect the waters and the animals and you know those traditional medicines that are disappearing. Up north, we have so many traditional medicines that are disappearing and it's sad because some of these medicines have been used to cure cancer, but they are vanishing, uh, whether it be you know, industry or whether it be just people being negligent with where they walk. We need to walk in unity with the earth to be able to move forward in a good way and be able to maintain all of our future generations. So, hi, hi, thanks. Thank you, Chantal, that was really great. Um, before we move on to uh, our last presentation, um, just a quick reminder that we are gonna do a short Q&A after this um, and it would be really great if you're able to stick around for that uh, last call to submit questions through the chat. Um, we have some great folks who are putting those and compiling well together so that we have them ready and uh, they will be put in a blog post if we don't have a chance to get to the majority of them. Um, yeah, so please stick around if you're able. All right, so the last presentation will be from Sarah Nason, who is with uh, CPAWS Northern Alberta, and she's gonna be talking about some of the actions that we can take. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Chantelle, so much for those words. We really appreciate um, you joining on the call today. Thank you so much. Um, so I was just gonna run through some quick ways to take action on this issue. Um, I know a lot of you out there may have already kind of done what the basics in terms of sending a letter to your MLA and getting one of these Defend Alberta Parks lawn signs. Um, but if you haven't already, we are continuing to distribute those lawn signs and you can get at those at defendabparks.ca. So you can request a sign there and a volunteer will drop it off to you. And we're continuing to expand that uh, campaign to uh, other areas in Alberta. So you can um, expect the campaign to reach uh, smaller communities if you're out in Red Deer or anything like that. Um, we are starting to expand in that direction. So, um, And we are also distributing Defend Alberta Parks stickers and pins. So you can contact us for those and we can mail them to you. And they will also be appearing in some local businesses soon. So um, make sure that you follow us on our social media feeds and we will keep you updated on all those things. 
Um, so if you have already done these kind of um, first steps of engagement, um, the next thing that we would really appreciate you doing if you do want to continue kind of taking action is to engage with your network. So let your neighbors, family, friends, hiking buddies know about the issue um, and encourage them to do some of those steps as well. Um, really through word of mouth is one of the most powerful things out there. So it's a great way to keep the things, keep things rolling. Um, and then another project that we have been running um, is called Mapping Memories. So we are trying to um, kind of document the experiences that people have been having in these um, parks that are being removed from the system. Um, and just showing that people do have wonderful memories um, in these areas and they are used. So um, this is a project just to kind of highlight that and we're always accepting more submissions. Um, so your photos and your stories. Um, so if you have visited one of these parks, please do send your memories to Brooke. Um, her email address is there up on the screen, bcapelle at cpaws.org. And this is an example of one of the submissions for Etherington Creek. Um, so people have shared really, really beautiful words about their experiences in the parks. Um, and it's just lovely to see. So it's another way to kind of um, get, get together around the issue as well. Uh, another project that's going on on the side is called I Use Alberta Parks. Um, so this is another uh, project to kind of show that the parks are used and people do value these areas. So there's two things that you can do with IU's Alberta Parks. One is adopting a park. So um, of the 175 that are um, being removed from the system, we're trying to get someone to adopt each one of those parks and put a sign at the trailhead um, or at the parking lot, um, letting people know that the park is at risk. So you can sign up for a park and get a sign to print out at home. Um, and then you can also log your visits to all of those parks and that is helping us to show that these parks are used and to kind of combat this claim that they're underutilized. So that's iusealbertaparks.org. Um, and we also have a CPAWS action challenge that's mainly being run by the Southern Alberta CPAWS chapter. Um, and this is a provincial contest that's designed to increase youth environmental action and awareness. So you can make a team and submit environmental actions to earn points and the top team with the most points will win a cash prize. So there is that motivation and there's also the motivation of just getting out together and making a positive difference with your actions. Um, and so many actions count as uh, including writing a letter to your MLA or getting one of the Defend Alberta Parks lawn signs. So this is a great activity um, to include classrooms and families in, um, and you can read more about that at actionchallenge.ca. Okay, so that is a quick run through of actions. I thought I'd try to keep that pretty short so we can move on to the Q&A uh, section of the call. Um, so I will pass things back to Emily for the Q&A. All right, thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much for that. Um, all right, well, we will dive right, right in. We have a number of questions uh, to get to. So um, just right off the top, a quick one for Nikita. Uh, is it possible to get art for Alberta Parks prints? Thanks for the question. Um, that is not something that I've explored quite yet since the sale was kind of a one-off thing. Um, I mean, like you probably heard in my presentation, it was a bit of a hectic time that all came together. So we didn't think that far in advance. So as of now, we are not, and we don't have any plans for the future, but it is possible that that's something that will come up. Um, if we do decide to reach out to the artists, or if I decide to make prints of my own work, I will make sure to let CPAWS know so that they can distribute the information. And so you can uh, keep updated with that. But as of now, we don't have any plans. Okay, thank you. Um, this is an email from Lise. So thank you, Lise, for the email. Um, Lise asked it, for some clarity on the implications of the optimization plan and mining in Alberta. She says that there's some confusion uh, among Albertans about how this plan ties into the UCP's rescinding of the 1976 coal policy um, and that it would be helpful to outline the direct linkage between these two decisions. Could uh, one of our panelists please elaborate on this and what it would mean for mining, water, and ecosystems in Alberta. 
And how does our mining policy differ from that in BC and why does this matter? So perhaps maybe one of our um, CPAWS panelists could answer that, Becky? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so there actually isn't any direct evidence that these two decisions are connected. Um, other than bad timing. It's like not a really fun year for us at CPOS. Um, but, you know, I think there is something we can learn um, behind the intent of both of these decisions. The first thing is that the government has clearly shown they're not interested in engaging with the public when it comes to environmental issues, because neither of these decisions included any public consultation. Uh, it's shown that they're really choosing to prioritize private in interests here. Um, there's evidence that they, they were met a ton with private coal lobbyists before they decided to rescind the, po the coal policy. And um, nobody has been consulted on parks except businesses that might take them over. Um, and I also think another thing it shows is that the government is choosing to prioritize industrial development whenever they can. So coal mining is obviously uh, really problematic in terms of where they are deciding to allow it moving forward. Um, and, and I can't speak to the specifics about the difference between um, BC coal mining policy in Alberta. I'm not familiar with uh, the legislation in British Columbia, but I can say that uh, it's not looking great for Alberta moving forward with the rescission of the coal policy. Um, and so I also encourage everybody to write their MLAs and also write uh, the federal minister of the environment about this issue. Okay, thanks, Becky. Um, this might be another uh, CPAWS question, but how many species, and actually this is an Instagram one, sorry, Instagram from uh, Alpha Artist, I think it is. Um, so how many species will be affected by the disappearance um, or delisting of these protected areas? Thousands. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to switch just a little bit. So um, just what we've seen on a uh, municipal level and some of the uh, parks around here that have been bought and sold by developers, we're seeing these exponential drops in species counts just from things like constructing ring roads. Um, and it's really disheartening when we look at the lack of consultation, not only with the public, but also with um, Indigenous communities who technically, if it's a crown land, and you have to go through Indigenous communities that that is their traditional territory. Um, but unfortunately, that has not been in here too. Uh, we've been watching um, even microorganisms uh, disappear within lakes. And then, in, of course, that's the canary in the coal mine, because as soon as those microorganisms go, then you're starting to see, you know, the bugs go, and then the birds go, and then, you know, some of the uh, upper predators go. So it's, it's a slippery slope. And um, it's not going to be recognizable in, you know, 30 years if we allow this to continue. Thanks, Chantal. Um, this is a CPAWS question for sure. Has CPAWS been in contact with any of the existing operating partners or campground operators? Um, and, and where is that at? Uh, I guess it would depend on what would we be contacting them about specifically. Um, we have not reached out in particular to any um, existing facility operator agreements. Um, yeah, it, it's sort of a bit uh, getting outside of our, our capacity to go to, to each um, of the 121 operators to, to uh, discuss these issues with them ultimately. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, this is a good question for those of us uh, who perhaps joined closer to the middle or end of the call. Um, but uh, um, Raven is asking, what specifically is the reason given for um, delisting these parks? Um, and can we just give a quick reminder about that? Sorry, I missed that question. I was. <laughs> uh, 
Ray, Ray, Raven's asking, um, and I think this is a good reminder for, for people who maybe joined a little bit later, um, what specifically is the reason for delisting these parks? Um, that's a great question. Um, the government hasn't really provided um, any rationale behind why the parks need to be delisted. Uh, in their initial press release, uh, the rationale behind the Optimizing Alberta Parks plan was essentially to save money um, with the, because of the current economic times. However, um, the parks don't really need to be delisted in order to pursue those third party operating agreements, um, which would be presumably where those, those savings would come from. So um, we haven't heard from the government on why the, um, these sites need to be delisted. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Chantelle, um, this might be a good question for you. Uh, are there any indigenous led campaigns or groups uh, that the public can support or amplify um, this person who sent in the question thought that there might be one combating the change to mining policies. Um, yes, I know specifically down in Kainai, there's a campaign um, against the uh, proposed uh, coal mine that's going to be kind of like the Black Falls area. And uh, half of the community in Black Falls is very involved in that as well. So what we're seeing is a lot of not only um, smaller communities that will be directly affected it by uh, some of these proposed changes, then also Indigenous communities that know the rights of the land. Um, it's really unfortunate because it is an Alberta jurisdiction issue that um, because Indigenous people fall under a federal jurisdiction there's a lot of pushback and fight and there's a lot of red tape but this has been going on for generations where indigenous people have been standing up saying this is not okay Alberta and um, Alberta's like not our problem you're the federal government's problem and by the time any jurisdiction comes down the pipe or any decisions come down the pipe it's already too late and that development has already gone on so um, we are trying to stand up and we're that's the thing, we just need more community involvement. We need to, to share a lot more of these campaigns. Um, and it's really difficult with so social media because you tend to be siloed with social media. It's really hard to kind of share with multiple groups um, just because of the way that social media is structured. You see your bubble and you don't see outside of that. So I encourage people to just start poking outside their bubble and see what other indigenous communities are doing because you'd be amazed at the work that's already going on. Okay, thank you so much, Chantal, for answering that. Um, one last question here, and this should be a quick one. Um, where, uh, where can we learn about which parks are being closed and get that full list? So uh, I can take that one. Um, initially, the, uh, when the government made their announcement, they released a series of PDF documents that had maps of where the sites were located, as well as a full um, tabulated list. Um, since the announcement, um, those documents have all been removed from the government websites. Um, I don't believe they're uh, publicly available anymore without having to use um, the cached copies via the Internet Archives. Um, we're still not quite sure why the government has removed them. They haven't clarified why they were removed. Um, but um, we do have uh, a link to that list on our website, um, a link to the, the original list. Uh, and that can be, uh, I will post that in the chat for you. Wait, wait was that a, a comment from someone in the, here or was that from online? I believe that was from the chat. Uh, so otherwise, um, you can definitely post on the chat, that would be great. Um, but there are a number of questions that we haven't been able to get to. So uh, I believe those will likely be answered in a blog post um, so that that will be able to be found there as well. And I, um, I would just like to uh, provide one point of clarification. Uh, I might've spoke a bit quickly there on one of those questions in terms of whether we had uh, reached out to any of the existing facility operators. Um, we haven't so, uh, so much for the um, provincial parks or the provincial recreation areas, but we've talked to a number of the natural area um, stewards, um, and specifically the, um, the JJ Collette, where we actually just spoke at their AGM. And um, they are not uh, happy that their, their natural area is, is on these lists um, and uh, don't want to see it unprotected. So. And um, none of the um, natural area stewards have really received any 
information from the government on what will be happening to the natural areas that they're stewarding. So um, we have discussed with some people, but um, not really the, the campsite operators. Just want to clarify. Okay, thank you for, for clarifying, Chris. Um, all right, well, that brings us to the end of our Q&A. And like I mentioned before, um, I believe that we are going to try to get um, some of those questions that weren't answered and perhaps also some of the ones that were just for those who couldn't make it um, up on a blog post, blog post uh, FAQ, um, hopefully sometime in the next little while. And then you can definitely check back there if you're um, hoping to review some of that information as well. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening uh, to CPAWS Northern and Southern Alberta and to Arcturus Calgary and West Edmonton for hosting this event. Um, to all the great panelists and, and the presentations that we were able to listen to and uh, Chantal for sharing um, your knowledge and the beautiful opening song. Um, and please stick around because she's going to close us off as well. So um, please stay for that. Uh, if you are, um, if you want to stay up to date with what's happening with the parks issue, you can go to defendalbertaparks.ca uh, for more information there. And um, yeah, like I said, please stay tuned for that blog post as well. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I will pass things back to Chantal to wrap things up for the evening with the closing song. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. And thank you everyone for sharing and being here, this is such an important um, issue and I think it's going to really make a difference. I always say that the reason I do activism and I stand up for the environment and stand up for the animals and the plants that don't have a voice, well, if you don't know what to listen for, um, is for my kids. Every time I look at them, uh, I'm like, I have to make sure that the world is a better place for you. And that is my responsibility. Um, so this is why I don't sit back and be quiet. But um, it's also, you know, to honor my relatives that have got me to this point um, as a First Nations woman. We're, we're stewards of this land. We're the ones um, who not, need to protect it and need to understand the stories that uh, connect to it. Um, and Part of that is just to honor the journey that we are all on together and to recognize that it's a, not an us versus them, but in order to um, you know, come to a place of understanding and come to a place where when we say all my relations, we understand that we are all related and we all, you know, if one suffers, we all suffer and one thrives, we all thrive. So it's about really coming together and finding those, uh, that common ground so that we can move forward in a good way for all of our future generations. Uh, so the song that I wanted to share with you, uh, this is the uh, creator song. This is a Cree song. And um, it just reminds us that we all share a sacred breath. You know, all of the plants, the animals, uh, the earth, the sky, we are all deeply connected. Um, and it reminds us that our breath is our voice. It's what fuels each and every one of us. It's what connects each and every one of us. Um, and it honors our journey on this road. So this is the Cree Creator song. <laughs>
Thanks, everyone. Hope you all had a good night. Thank you, Chantal. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Makwitch, everyone. Hi, hi.